living with, through, or beyond cancer. Cancer survivorship is a process. Diagnosis is certainly the dominant way to conceptualize psychopathology across not only cancer, but across all populations. Physical symptoms like weight change, like um, sleep issues and fatigue, inconsistent DSM diagnoses only, and the applicable and applicability of those diagnoses and the research coming out of that is questionable. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new edition of the interview series Beyond the Cancer Diagnosis. Today, my guest is Darren Haywood from the University of Technology of Sydney. Hi, Darren. Thank you for accepting my invitation. And um, thank you for the invite. Uh, I'm sure that will be a very interesting discussion because the subject it's um, uh, let's say uh, not so often used in the psych oncology uh, field. And uh, I will uh, start uh, this interview uh, with um, sort of um, clarification of terms. Uh, about uh, cancer survivors, cancer survivorships. Um, there are two terms that uh, they are often used, of course, by psych oncologists, but not always in the right context. Mm -hmm. So I would uh, like to ask you first to define these notions in terms of definitions, and then if there is a difference between them, if not, make a briefly explanation of of this yes excellent it's a great place to start yeah so the term cancer survivor has not really been consistently used and this goes across um, clinical practice and research so historically we've often gotten um, two different people using the same term cancer survivor but meaning totally different things or different things across the um, journey of cancer survivorship. So in recent years, we've settled on a more consistent definition of the term cancer survivor. So this definition is more encapsulating of the entire process and spectrum of people that have experienced cancer. So really anyone living with, through, or after a cancer diagnosis is someone that's considered a cancer survivor. So from the points from diagnosis onwards, that person can be conceptualized or classified as a cancer survivor. When we're referring to cancer survivorship, this on the other hand refers to the process of living with, through, or beyond cancer. This includes all the person's experiences, all their aspects of life, and all their facets of well-being. Good. Uh, in addition with this, um explanations and definitions uh, we are going now a little bit further because uh, you mentioned cancer survivorship is a process and it uh, it is very imp uh, important to know uh, for us as a specialist and for cancer patients that uh, once you, uh, you you are a cancer survivor and you um, uh, win the, the battle with uh, with cancer the uh, your cancer experience is not finished and now we are going in this area of mental health condition uh, and some of the patients uh, may experience or may not experience mental health uh, conditions unfortunately uh, mental health condition uh, classification is not a primary subject and it, it depends very much on the cultural break background. For example, in Europe, as I mentioned before, um, the disorder statistic manual is for us like a, let's say, like a Bible. So we don't know or we don't have access to other uh, mental uh, health conditions, uh, manuals or guidebooks. Uh, first, I would like to ask you, what is your personal opinion about uh, DSM? Uh, as a structure or as a concept? Absolutely, yeah. So taking a bit of a step back, so diagnosis is certainly the dominant way to conceptualize psychopathology across not only cancer, 
but across all populations. So diagnostic approaches like this conceptualize psychopathology as these discrete categories that we know as disorders. So across these um, diagnostic conceptualization, really the backbone to that is diagnostic tools. And one of these tools, like you said, is the DSM. That's really what is called, often called the gold standard tool for diagnoses. So within this um, dominant way of thinking about psychopathology, it involves a range of different listed symptoms within the DSM. And an individual just needs to be um, present or needs to present with a subset of these symptoms to be classified with a certain disorder or certain diagnosis. So the DSM has served psychoncology and just psychology and psychiatry generally as well for decades. But in the more recent years, particularly over the past um, decade or so, there's been increased criticism or recognition of the quite significant limitations of the DSM and the diagnostic approach as a whole Particularly, many of these limitations apply um, particularly well to cancer survivor populations. So it's really important for us to understand those limitations of tools like the DSM and within cancer survivor populations and how we might mitigate some of those pitfalls and move forward with different approaches. Uh, you said about um, the limitation of this uh, guidebook. Um, I will... Uh... I want to ask you like uh, additional questions. Um, you said uh, in the recent years. Uh, um, do you think um, as a professional uh, that um, COVID-19 is one of the sources that uh, show the DSM limitations in terms of uh, diagnosis? Because uh, uh, after uh, 2022, when uh, COVID uh, let's say, of not officially ended, but uh, it's, it's a constant uh, disease. A lot of new uh, disease uh, evolved and uh, a lot of mental uh, health conditions evolved. Uh, do you think of it? It's one of the sources that proved the DSM limitation? Um, it's a very interesting question. I think that goes beyond just the DSM or diagnoses um, to the broader, more philosophical question of what are mental illnesses and what is psychopathology? So how do we differentiate that from normality and when does normality become pathology? So I think that's um, a broader question and is something that's important to reflect on when it comes to something like you mentioned, like COVID-19, which um, could have resulted in heightened distress across the population, and whether the, that distress falls into psychopathology, or now is that um, closer to the border of just a normal interaction and a normal um, reaction to a very distressing event. So a lot of these types of questions and these um, reflections on what psychopathology is can come back to these diagnostic approaches and how this may fit within mental health classification as a whole. Uh, you mentioned, um, uh, let's say, the philosophic uh, part of what uh, it's being normal. Um, the society evolved very much in the past decades and now we are talking about artificial intelligence uh, digital interventions and uh, so on and so forth so uh, in my opinion and i believe that uh, as much as the society evolves the notion of being normal it's in a permanent uh, uh, not a change of definitions but it's all the time struggle with what normal or normality means and uh, with focus on uh, uh, this uh, uh, discussion in this regard um, I, uh, I saw, I read that uh, in order to rethinking what you mentioned before in terms of uh, mental health uh, challenges 
uh, about a hundred of experts argue that uh, there is a better way or there could be a better way called hierarchical taxonomy of psychopathology or HITOP. Could you make us uh, a description of what HIT HITOP, I guess it's the correct term, no? Uh, yes, absolutely. HITOP. HITOP. What uh, high yes. uh, means and uh, its structure. Absolutely, yeah. So um, I think it might be useful to take a bit of a step back and maybe summarize some of these key limitations of this diagnostic approach, because this is really what spurred on the development of high top. And then I can give some background around what high top is and what the goals of the system are. So from my perspective, there are four key limitations to diagnostic approaches, and this includes tools being used with that, so like the DSM. So the first is binary categories. So the DSM and diagnostic approaches is a binary system with which an individual either meets or does not meet the criteria for a particular disorder. And diagnosis or non-diagnosis can impact someone's referral, their treatment streams, the, the treatment techniques used, and the support of care resources as a whole. However, the more modern empirical research shows that mental health is instead dimensional, with symptoms presenting on a continuum of severity rather than within these categorical disorders. And further, these mod modern statistical analyses as of symptom level data has found that those DSM categories and the symptoms within those don't often result from factor analytic assessments of those symptoms. The second limitation is um, comorbidity. So comorbidity is quite a, um, a limitation that's often spoken about when it comes to diagnosis and tools like the DSM. So around half the people who meet the criteria for one disorder will meet the criteria for a second. And approximately half of those people that meet the criteria for two disorders will meet the criteria for a third, and so on and so on. The issue with this is that it makes the study of any single disorder very, very difficult. And further, comorbidity is often an exclusion criteria from many clinical trials when it comes to treatment trials as well. So this means a lot of the results that we see from clinical trials within psycho psychopathology and psychooncology may only be applicable to actually a minority of the population, which don't present with a comorbidity. The third is within disorder symptom heterogeneity. So the DSM provides a range of these symptoms for each disorder, with an individual only needing to meet a subset of those symptoms to meet that criteria for that disorder. So this means that two individuals diagnosed with the same disorder can actually present with very different symptom profiles. So take, for example, using a rather conservative calculation that um, the DSM listed symptom criteria for major depressive disorder has over 900 unique different symptom profiles someone can have and be diagnosed with major depressive disorder. And further, even two people can have the same DSM diagnoses, but share even no or very few common symptoms. So this means that a diagnosis really doesn't provide that necessary clinical information to inform clinical practice to a degree that really facilitates optimal care. The final key limitation I would like to speak about, and this is really important within cancer survivorship, is physical symptoms. So physical symptoms like weight change, like um, sleep issues and fatigue, are some of the most commonly listed symptoms across the disorders listed in the DSM. However, of course, many of these symptoms may be present for a cancer survivor, but not necessarily due to their mental states, but rather due to the impacts of cancer and their treatments. So many cancer survivors may actually be at an increased risk of being misdiagnosed or under or overdiagnosed if proper case formulation isn't used. So these are just some of these key limitations of the diagnostic approach. And these have become increasingly a focus within recent years. So this is where um, HITOP comes in. So HITOP stands for the Hierarchical Taxonomy of Psychopathology. And it was born out of the body of literature 
that has explored the empirical structure of psychopathology. And these approaches mostly use factor analytic approaches, looking at how symptoms and larger groups of these symptoms come together and sit within these larger hierarchical structures. So Hightop really brings together this literature to provide one overall empirically based structure of psychopathology. So how does Hightop differ from something like the DSM? Well, it doesn't conceptualize psychopathology as these discrete categories called disorders, but rather a collection of higher and lower level domains, which are each measured on a continuum of severity. So instead, people aren't diagnosed with disorders within high top, but rather their entire psychopathology is measured and conceptualized on a number of domains, moving from more specific domains um, to more general domains, moving up to the top of the hierarchy. You mentioned and you talk about <clears throat> the, uh, let's say, more uh, like research part of high top, coming from... Uh, uh literature uh, perspective, but um, uh, how is HITOP integrating in practice? Do you have like practical results or clinical trials that, uh, uh, let's say, not prove, but uh, uh, show the, the positive outcomes of HITOP? Yes, we have a range of preliminary research of integrating HITOP within clinical practice. And there are a range of other trials and um, research that are currently happening for integrating high top within clinical practice. So the preliminary results of the integration of high top into clinical practice tends to show that clinicians prefer high top over the DSM when it comes to communicating with patients, when it comes to overall case conceptualization, as well as to treatment planning. And there have also been a number of guidelines and recommendation documents on how to integrate high top into clinical practice that have been published. And there are also currently field trials underway to explore the usability, the acceptability, and really the feasibility of high top within general clinical practice. However, unfortunately, high top hasn't really been meaningfully used within cancer. And this is unfortunate, as it really has that significant potential to improve research and clinical practice within this population. However, for this to happen, the high top structure must first be confirmed within a cancer survivor population before we can make those inroads into clinical practice and use it within clinical psycho-oncology research. So that's really research to have a look at, does the high top structure and the high top model apply within a cancer survivor population? Does that structure look the same? So when we understand the structure of psychopathology within cancer survivorship, and if this matches that of high top, we can move forward with field trials and clinical research within this population. I noticed that uh, uh, high top also went digital under the high top uh, digital assessment and tracker instrument. Uh, could you develop uh, this uh, term? It's I guess on the same foundation as high top, but what is different on, let's say, going digital in uh, in on high top? Absolutely. So um, the high top consortium has a number of different working groups. So, for instance, there's a clinical group looking at the integration of high top within clinical, um, and there's also a high top measurement development working group. And they have really been part of work to identify existing measurement tools that can be used to measure high top domains, as well as develop these new purpose-built measures, particularly for high top. So one of these measures is the high top DATS, or the Digital Assessments and Tracker Instruments. So this is a digital tool that uses a collection of previously established mental health measures that are open access, free to access and use for clinicians. So these really are a collection or battery of measures that assess multiple key domains of high top through a digital tracker system. There's also the high top self-report. So this is um, also available, which is a large purpose-built comprehensive self-report self tool that provides this really comprehensive and thorough assessment 
across the high top model. So this is a more lengthy measure than the high top DAT. So this is 405 items. So it's something that we could be seen to be used within the um, research setting or as a really in-depth clinical tool as well. And there's a range of different and other purpose-built measures that are currently being developed by HITOP. And if anyone's interested in that, um, a quick Google of HITOP, H-I-T-O-P, will bring up their webpage and show all their available resources that are all free to access as well. Thank you uh, for, for uh, <clears throat> this uh, uh, explanation. Uh, now I want uh, not to go back uh, in uh, in uh, back to psych oncology because uh, you mentioned that high top uh, it's very uh, has a thin relation with uh, with cancer. Um, but uh, uh, I want to ask you as a also a professional and as a researcher that um, there are a lot of experts uh for from few decades now that uh, are talking about the paradox of oncology in the way that uh the clinical oncology yeah and the uh, psych oncology some way uh, so, or somehow uh, developed in different directions and uh, uh, uh when uh, for example the clinical oncology evolved tremendous in the last decades, the psychology part remains on, let's say, the same level. So they didn't have these uh, um, outcomes that people need. So uh, this is the paradox. One component, it's very much uh, developed. The other one, it's uh, not underdeveloped, but not in the same way and not in the same direction. That's the most important thing that uh, some uh, sometimes people don't know. Uh, they are not going on the same direction. So uh, obviously there is a gap here in, uh, uh, in uh, also in research, but uh, mostly in practice. Uh, do you think that, uh, for example, DSM or high top, it's a uh, a necessary tool, not useful, but a necessary tool in order to try to reduce this gap? Yes, it's a very interesting question. So there have, for years, there's been these significant discussions around, you know, the limitations of this diagnostic approach based research for the discovery of these etiological factors of psychopathology. So those are the factors that may cause and maintain psychopathology, as well as treatment approaches. So as you can imagine, if these DSM disorders are not consistent things, um, any consistent association between a particular etiological factor, say talking about biomedical, whether it be a gene or um, a particular level of neurotransmitters, for instance, et cetera, and a particular disorder, the connection between those two things is really unlikely because those DSM disorders are not consistent. So this has really been the case, what we've seen historically, there's never been a one-to-one -one correspondence of really any etiological factor and any particular disorder. Um, however, dimensional approaches like that of high top offer a very exciting potential for research into these etiological factors of psychopathology, as well as new treatments and supportive care options. So dimensional approaches, like we said, don't put individuals into these highly variable in inconsistent categories, but instead use those dimensional um, domains for assessments. So this means there's potential for this more reliable and more valid research within psycho-oncology. And high top can also interface with more biomedical focused approaches like the RDOC approaches for future psycho-oncology research. There's been a range of discussion papers around how um, those two might intersect and connect. But first, high top needs to be structurally validated within cancer survivorship populations. So I'll keep going back to that point that that's the first step we need to make that does this fit within these cancer survivor populations and if so, we can move forward into these um, other approaches and research, including that 
of linking these more biomedical and traditional assessment approaches with high top and psychopathology. Thank you uh, very much for uh, for this uh, uh, answer and explanation. And now, uh, as a last question, and uh, I would like to ask you as a professional. Um, recently, I uh, I saw an interview with uh, Mac Tyrrell. Maybe you know her. Um, she's a CNN uh, medical correspondent, and she was talking about uh, a prediction based on some statistics for example on uh, cancer within uh, masculine population that uh, will explode till 2030 uh, so the statistic that she she uh, show us uh, proved that uh, in the future one of two men uh, will uh, have to do a, a cancer fighting or battle uh, with regard to your field of ex uh, expertise, uh, mental health condition, um, do you think that um, the, let's say, this field of high top or DSM or mental health uh, uh, domain as an entire uh, is ready for such challenges or how much would be the impact because life is changing and also the, the subdomains have to change itself frequently. How much uh, do you think is this impact on uh, mental health uh, uh, yes. conditions? Um, that, that is an excellent question. And um, you know, people are more people are living from cancer and living longer from cancer, which means more people require support as well. So we know that cancer survivors, um, even long term, are more at risk for experiencing psychopathology. So it is extremely important for us to improve our understanding of psychopathology and the way we conceptualize and assess psychopathology and offer treatments and track supportive care strategies as well. And of course, um, coming back to those diagnostic approaches, if the majority of research is based on these more um, inconsistent DSM diagnoses only and the applicable and applicability of those diagnoses and the research coming out of that is questionable. We might um, be in a position where cancer survivors are not receiving optimal care when it comes to psychopathology. So I think it's fundamental at this point for us is to take a step back and think about the way we conceptualize psychopathology in research and in the clinic. And um, think about approaches like high top and other more empirically based approaches with which we can make strides towards more data driven understanding of psychopathology and um, assess treatments and supportive care options, as well as assessments to go along with these new modern understandings and um, make sure we in the right place to help support people to provide the most optimal care possible for cancer survivors. So to finish the interview, because we are running out of time, to finish it in a positive way, the awareness and prevention remain, or still remain the best options for any patient. Because, uh, and psychoeducation remains as a, a main foundation in, on, on the future uh, patients, because uh, it, uh, I know, you know, it's difficult, uh, to, to prevent is uh, difficult for, for people to uh, recognize that might have or might not have. So uh, in a society that it's <laughs> in a turmoil, uh, sometimes uh, we have to think about ourselves and uh, sometimes we have to ch check ourselves to see if we are going in the right direction or no. Uh, Darren, thank you very much for uh, being with uh, us today. Very interesting the subjects, very interesting the definitions. Thank you very much. And uh, good luck uh, on uh, your uh, uh, high top development alongside with your colleagues from the university. Thank you for having me. It was lovely to speak about this really important topic.
Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.